Good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Oglesby. I am the interim president and CEO of EMSDC and your um, humble host today as we have a dynamic presentation in store for the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act today. Um, EMSDC is here to provide innovative content for our MBEs and in conjunction with our corporate membership to investigate opportunities and how our MBEs can have immediate and direct access to it and be first in line. Um, my role here is brief. I'm merely a host and I will introduce our provocateur and um, chief presenter here to, for today's process and educational seminar, um, Paul Douglas. And I'll let Paul Douglas take over. Uh, thank you, Brian, and good morning, everyone. I know folks are still uh, still jumping in, so I'll give them a few seconds. I'm really, really excited for today's webinar, and I'll tell you why. Um, a few uh, few weeks ago, we uh, we had a chance to do some research. Uh, we presented why are some small business or companies in general more successful than others, and one of the things that came uh, up that we weren't all expecting to come up was timing, right? Is can my is my organization providing the right product, the right service at the right time? And the reason why I share that background is the IIJA. The goal for today's webinar is to make sure that you guys understand that it is the right time for a lot of your products and services. You may not know, and I'm so excited today. We have a very very dynamic um, dynamic panel. Um, not only that, we have two Dinas, we have two Brian's. I don't think it gets any better uh, than that. So. I'm gonna start off by doing some brief introduction. I would like the team to do a brief intro. So name, title, the organization that you're with and a um, small, small fact on your favorite holiday dish. All right, so name, title, organization that you're with and your favorite holiday gift. I'm gonna start off with Tom from Pico, go right ahead. Sure, I'm Tom Bonner, Senior Manager, State Government Affairs for Pico. Uh, been with Pico about 15 years, and I was the lead author of our successful 2009 application for a $200 million smart grid investment grant. And I'm very much involved with the team that's working to bring some uh, IIJA dollars home to uh, Southeastern PA. Um, my, I, It's not really a favorite dish, but it's a great conversation starter and interest in others' opinions. My wife and I have a brutal argument between ourselves about whether or not corn belongs on the Thanksgiving table. I am a strong supporter of corn. <laughs> she is a vehement opponent of corn. So I'm interested in what others have to say on this. Tom, we'll do a vote if we have time permitted. Uh, <laughs> Zoom poll. Awesome. awesome, nice to meet you. Thanks, Tom, for uh, joining us today. Uh, next, we have uh, Lawrence uh, from American Water. Sure. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I'm really here as uh, support for Dina uh, and American Water, but uh, again, uh, open to any questions. But I'm the senior manager of supplier diversity for American Water. Been with the company just over five years, but been within the supplier diversity space for, I guess you would say, for up to 30 years. But uh, glad to be here and uh, support this uh, initiative by EMSDC and the MBEIC. Uh, my favorite dish, and I guess we're focused on Thanksgiving uh, really is uh, my mother's recipe for uh, stuffing. Uh, my mother, of course, uh, has passed on now, but my wife uh, stood very closely to my mother during many holiday seasons, and now she makes that stuffing. And now my daughter-in-law uh, makes that stuffing. So uh, I would say that's my favorite dish for uh, the upcoming holiday. Awesome! Thanks for sharing, Lawrence. I appreciate it. I Dina Cooper Williams. And I'm Dina Cooper Williams. I'm the senior supplier diversity program lead for uh, American Water, uh, supporting our national supplier diversity initiatives. Um, I do have a, a, a very clear focus on New Jersey and Pennsylvania because they are some of our larger states uh, with the biggest footprint. Um, and I would say for me, it's all about the mac and cheese, the right ratio of the of the cheese. You don't want it too cheesy, but you got to make sure the cheese is, is spread uh, thoroughly throughout the, the dish. So it's all about the mac and cheese for me. Awesome. That's a, that's, that's a tough uh, that's a tough one to, to go up against. Uh, <laughs> Dean, I appreciate it. Uh, next, we have Brian from PennDOT. 
All right, good morning and, and, and thank you, Paul. It really is a pleasure to be here. My name is Brian Hare, I'm the other Brian, and I am the uh, director of the Program Center at PennDOT. So uh, we, we kind of help manage and, and direct where the new IIJ funds will go, what projects and, and, and such, and we'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation this morning. But I, I really do, Paul, uh, appreciate this effort from a PennDOT perspective, I'll say thank you because uh, IIJA uh, means a lot to us and all hands on deck. So any opportunities we have to get new partners on board, uh, absolutely appreciated. And uh, and then to the important question, I'll be cooking our Thanksgiving dinner uh, this week and, and my focus is really on the stuffing. So I'll echo Lawrence. It's, it's important for me to get it right and I'm trying to be a little innovative and spice things up. So uh, wish me the best. Looking forward to tackling the stuffing on Thursday morning. Thank you. Nice call, Brian. I hope yeah. You. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Uh, that's a that's a number two for stuffing. Awesome. Next we have uh, DJ, also Dina Jefferson from Franklin Energy. Good morning, everyone. Dina Jefferson. I'm with Franklin Energy. Energy. Uh, Franklin Energy is an energy efficiency organization. We focus on all things energy efficiency and demand response. I've been with the organization since 2021, um, but I've spent the majority of my career in the uh, energy space. Prior to working for Franklin, I worked for Pepco Holdings, supporting the DC regulatory division. And then before that, I spent some time in Northwest Indiana um, supporting the legal regulatory division for the North for Northern Indiana Public Service Company or NIPSCO, which falls underneath a nice source. Um, and you know, this is a toss up because my mother's dressing is amazing, too. So you've got three for that. But she always would pack me a sweet potato pie, which is the best. Hers is the best, uh, hands down. All right. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we have Skip with Ando. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. And uh, yeah, so Skip Wilshire Gordon with the Andil Policy Group. We're a small uh, advocacy uh, lobbying firm uh, working on exclusively on clean energy and energy efficiency issues, uh, represent clients from across uh, energy efficiency and clean energy spaces uh, based in D.C. Um, and we, uh, we're we very engaged uh, on, on IIJA, so very excited to be talking about that today, as well as some some notable provisions from the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and so, so as far as the question, I would have to say, um, sweet potatoes are always up there, DJ. So that was a great flag. Mine, uh, is actually Brussels sprouts. Uh, and I need to be very clear here because boiled Brussels sprouts are not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about roasted very, very strongly, uh, and then, uh, covered in a balsamic glaze with honey. Uh, so that is what I'm going to be working on Thursday, uh, for my family. So that's my, that's my go-to would never have thought growing up, I would have been saying a vegetable here, but, uh, Brussels sprouts can't be beat. So, awesome. That's good. That's a uh, that, that's interesting. So we have a uh, corn and Brussels sprouts. So the uh, Brussels sprouts are the two that stand out to me. So we'll do a vote later. Um, before we get started, uh, just to give you guys an agenda for today, uh, we have three presentations. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Brian from PennDOT, Skip from Mandel, and then Tom uh, from Pico gave a roughly a ten minute presentation from their lens when IIJA. Uh, please take a moment to jot down questions, thoughts, and as those questions come up, feel free to put it inside the chat right below your screen. You should see a uh, small icon that says Q&A. If you put those into the Q&A session, I'm going to make a strong effort to incorporate the questions into our Q&A panelist interview. So again, we have three presentations. It should take roughly 30 minutes, but I assume that 30 minutes will give us a really strong background of IAJA and it's some different lens, but start to put your questions in, inside the, uh, the Q&A section. I would also love if you guys can, in the chat function, let me know where you're from. So city, state, and what product or service you provide. That information also will give our team some perspective on how we can provide value uh, throughout this conversation. Uh, again, just uh, intro myself, Paul Douglas. I am president co-founder of the JPI Group. We're a Philadelphia-based uh, workforce development company. Um, and I am chair for the MBEIC, which means that my main goal and responsibility uh, partnering with Brian is to provide ideas, um, resources to help small business that are part, small certified MBEs that are part of the council to grow and scale. And the IIJ is a very, very strong uh, goal if I was going into 2023. With that said, I am going to turn this over to Brian from PennDOT. Again, he's gonna give us a, a roughly a 10 minute presentation on how IIJA and PennDOT's looking to help small business and MBEs in the Philadelphia, New Jersey, Delaware market. All right. And Paul, cameras on, cameras off for the presentation. Uh, I am a cameras on uh, guy, so I will say cameras on if possible, please. Thank you. 
Excellent. And, and, and thank you. Thank you once again. This is a great opportunity Pen, from PennDOT's perspective. And that's what this is all about, is just sharing a little bit about an overview from IAJA or Bill on PennDOT's perspective. But absolutely, again, as I said, uh, we certainly need all hands on deck because there's a lot of new opportunities here, some very new uh, that I'll share about. But uh, we certainly need uh, any, any interested uh, small businesses and others, uh, please, if you're not already, please get engaged. But what is... Uh, just moving on then, next slide. Uh, we should be on the, the bipartisan infrastructure law bill slide with highlights. And I uh, really do appreciate this opportunity. It is a big deal for us. Uh, it's a big deal from a federal funding perspective. That's a big bulk of our funds, uh, our federal funding. Uh, it will help with some, but it certainly won't address all of PennDOT's needs for highways, bridges, and a whole lot of other things that PennDOT's involved with, uh, but it is welcomed. Uh, what's it mean, though? We also need matching funds for, for most of our programs are 80 percent federal, 20 percent local or 20 percent state. Sorry, uh, which means we do need our state funds as well to match that. So we're working on a variety of different opportunities to to uh, secure that funding for the future to make sure we're leveraging all those state dollars. Uh, so what's it mean? What's it really mean for PennDOT or for Pennsylvania? If we could uh, slip to the next slide then on the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, this is just a very brief uh, primer, I'll say, on transportation funding, not getting into the details here, uh, but just trying to give you a little bit of perspective. Overall, federal funding available for Pennsylvania's highways and bridges through the IAJA or bill, uh, and it is a five-year bill, by the way, 2022 through federal fiscal year 2026, uh, we'll be getting a total of $13.1 billion, of which of that $4 billion is new. So that was Nine of what we anticipated based on where we were previously, uh, four is provided by, uh, four billion with a B, uh, is provided by the IAJA. So it's a big boost to, to PennDOT, to Pennsylvania. Uh, so that's a lot of additional funding for, Pen, for PennDOT, uh, but it means an awful lot to our contractors and the folks in the private sector as well, because uh, they're the folks that we're gonna be looking to. Uh, you're the folks we're gonna be looking to if you're in the transportation sector to help us deliver these programs. And again, this slide gives you just a quick glimpse of the range of the different funding buckets. Uh, this is from the Highway Trust Fund. That's the dollars when you fill up your car at the pump. The dollars that you spend there, the taxes on the federal side go into the Highway Trust Fund. So that addresses our interstate system, that addresses other roadway, it addresses safety, rail crossings, uh, congestion relief, things of that nature. Uh, just real quick, the last two items on this slide, uh, you'll see um, two new programs under the Highway Trust Fund. That's carbon reduction, that's for cleaner air, and also PROTECT. It's a long acronym, we call it PROTECT, uh, but that's more for uh, resiliency, to address ex you know, extreme storm events and things of that nature. Next slide. We'll talk just very briefly ab about the general fund, and IIJA bill provides three new programs under the general fund. It includes two uh, new special bridge program funds. Obviously, addressing our bridges across the Commonwealth is, is vital. It's extremely important. So we appreciate that new additional funding. Uh, but what's extremely exciting is that third item, and that's our National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. I'll refer to it as NEVI. You may hear it referred to as NEVI. Um, and uh, that's key. Uh, and I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about NEVI. So if we can go to the next slide. This slide is all about how, how much uh, NEVI funding we have for Pennsylvania. I'll say nationally, uh, the NEVI formula program funds a total of $5 billion over the five-year life, again, of, of IIJA and Bill. Um, Pennsylvania, of that amount, is set to receive uh, $171.5 million over that five years. And what's the funding used for? That funding can be used for the installation and operation of electric vehicle chargers, installation of traffic control devices to uh, for directional information to those EV charging infrastructures, uh, could include signing, uh, as well as mapping and analysis of other activities related to that charging equipment. So what makes NEVI so unique is that, as you probably can imagine, PennDOT is not in the energy business. We're in the transportation sector, uh, nor do we intend to own electric vehicle charging stations, just the same as we don't own gasoline stations uh, today. Uh, so we're certainly going to be relying on a vast array of partners throughout all sectors of the related industry, uh, stakeholders to electric vehicle charging, uh, to ensure the success of the NEVI program in Pennsylvania. 
just real quick, staying on the, the topic of NEVI, uh, I want to show a little bit about our alternative fuels corridors, our AFCs, and PennDOT, like all state DOTs across the country, have been developing alternative fuel corridors across our Commonwealth. This is a, click, a quick glimpse of a map showing our alternative fuels corridors. Uh, Pennsylvania's alternative fuel corridors now include all interstates in Pennsylvania, as well as some interstate lookalike roadways, such as Route 30 across Pennsylvania or, or Route 15 north and south. And the, the key here is that the NEVI funding first must be spent along the alternative fuel corridors and not until we built out the term is built out our alternative fuel corridors. Can we start to uh, construct charging stations or fund the construction of charging stations on more local roadways? And, and I use the term built out. That means the charging stations are constructed not more than 50 miles apart and within one mile of an interchange along our interstates or other related roadways. So next, then we'll go back to talking about the funding. And I know this group is, is uh, based out of the southeastern part of the state. Uh, so this next slide is just a kind of a focus on the magnitude of the funding. And again, I know there's a lot on here and I apologize for that. Uh, but I've talked about our, our planning partners that we work with. They're the folks that we distribute the funding to in Pennsylvania. Um, and the DVRPC or the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission is the Philadelphia region's planning partner for, with PennDOT. Uh, so I pulled this slide together just to show a quick glimpse of what Bill really means to the Philadelphia region. So if you can see that the totals over on the far uh, right hand side, uh, that shows you that over the life of IAJ Bill, um, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission will get uh, over $500 million in additional funding over the five year life of bill. So just for that one region, it's a, it's a pretty significant boost uh, for transportation in the area. So think about that. So I've talked about the formula funding now, and that's the funding that we get and we distribute to our planning regions. There's also a lot of discretionary programs and hopefully this is gonna be of an interest to a lot of folks on the call for sure. Um, and then, so these next slides, I'm not gonna get into each one, but they outline the whole range of discretionary or competitive programs from IJA and Bill. These are funds that can be applied for in, in many cases by local communities, as well as uh, state departments of transportation or county governments or other, other uh, interested stakeholders. Uh, you see safe streets and roads for all at the top of that list. That's obviously a focus on safety uh, and that's safety, particularly in disadvantaged communities. You'll see an emphasis for a lot of these programs on spending funding in, in previously underserved uh, communities across the Commonwealth. You see PROTECT uh, listed on there. I talked about that as funding we distribute, but this is also a discretionary program that communities and, and others can apply for. Uh, we talked about NEVI. NEVI is, it has a formula component of the funds that we distribute to the Commonwealth that we get as PennDOT, but there's also the competitive element of NEVI that we need to be thinking about, that communities need to be thinking about today as they uh, consider opportunities um, for enhancements to, to uh, boost their local economies. You see reconnecting communities. Uh, that's kind of, you know, making, uh, a re reconnecting as the name applies, uh, areas that may have been dissected or bisected by uh, previous transportation projects. There's a real strong focus on disadvantaged communities and the competitive nature for reconnecting uh, communities. Uh, I won't go down the list, but there's rural surface transportation grants and, and other uh, reduction for truck emissions and, and such. Uh, so again, just a host and a whole variety of different programs. But the real challenge here and with these new discretionary programs is they all come with their unique rules. Uh, so you need to be clear and, and, and aware of who can apply, what projects may be eligible, whether or not there's matching funds that a local may have to uh, provide, uh, but just a lot of different rules. And it's important to understand the rules of the game as you uh, consider approaching these grants in the future. Uh, and with that next slide uh, on, on thriving communities, um, I wanna talk a little bit about that because that's a very new program out of the new bill, uh, IIJA. And uh, Thriving Communities provides grants to ensure that disadvantaged communities have the technical tools and organizational capacity to really comprehensively plan and deliver good projects through IIJA and Bill. Uh, and, and what that means is the program focuses on capacity builders, as you see on the slide. Those are uh, agencies 
uh, could be businesses uh, that have skills and abilities that they could offer to those communities that need a little bit of a leg up or additional support to be competitive in applying for and delivering um, these discretionary grants through IIJA and Bill. Uh, there's a focus on main streets. Uh, there's a main street component on uh, interconnected transportation houses and communities. There's uh, complete neighborhoods, which focus on urban and uh, suburban communities located in metro areas to help better coordinate uh, things like housing and economic development. And there's also network communities uh, with their focus on uh, how they relate to airports, connectivity to freight and rail and things of that nature uh, to address en environmental justice issues as well as economic issues. So the next slide you see should be our PennDOT approach. What are we doing? You know, the key is to stay informed and be aware. So again, thank you for the opportunity to share this morning. Uh, and we do have a website. The address is there and it's not really uh, uh, e e easily uh, to, to read, I'm sure. But I tell you what, if you, if you Google PennDOT, I-I-J-A slash Bill Discretionary, you'll find this webpage or go on the PennDOT's webpage and, and you'll find it uh, under doing business. Uh, but essentially, we want to make sure folks are aware of what's coming out. Folks in Pennsylvania, we want to make sure local communities uh, are aware and are teed up for success as best they can. So we've created a web page in which we post grant alerts. Uh, those are new opportunities. And as they are advertised by the USDOT, we, we develop these grant alerts, grant alerts and put those on our PennDOT webpage. Uh, and here's an example from the Thriving Communities Program that I just spoke about a moment ago. Um, and again, the, the grant alerts provide important facts when the deadlines are. And by the way, I pulled this one up and realized the deadline is not correct. Uh, for the capacity builders, those folks that want to help communities, the deadline is actually this November 29th. Uh, so there is uh, still a little bit of time left there. And I did inform my folks that we need to get this updated. But just so you know, uh, there's a little bit of time left for that if you're in an area where you may be uh, able to provide that little bit of help to communities in your area. So real quick, just to wrap things up, uh, these are some of our strategies that we've found that we're developing guidance on. We want to make that available to local communities and others. Uh, but the, the uh, competition for bill grants is certainly fierce. So we want to make sure uh, that the, the, the certain factors are kept in clear view when you're looking at ability or a, a opportunity for grant applications. You know, you want to organize around a strong partnership, uh, get together with the right folks um, early on, uh, and you want to be developing grant applications to the greatest and extent possible prior to the grant announcement. Earlier is better. Uh, as soon as the notice of funding opportunity is out, there's a strict time requirement there. Uh, time is always of the essence. So you want to start thinking about these, pursuing these opportunities earlier rather than later. Uh, data is a key, making sure you're looking at all possible data sources uh, for selecting grants, not just transportation, but other uh, data that may al al align with economic impacts of, of the grant or equity issues. Again, equity is a key uh, in a lot of these grant programs in order to be selected. Um, and then we talk about the benefit cost analysis. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using, again, good data to be able to clearly outline the benefits relative to the cost of your project that, uh, that uh, you may be uh, applying for a grant for. And then finally, to, to finish up here, just some free advice from our experience. We don't have a ton of experience, uh, but we do have some experience in grant writing. And we want to make sure if, if there's a PennDOT, or I'm sorry, a transportation connection, please coordinate early with PennDOT. If you're working with a local community or you're working yourself, uh, if there's a transportation element, keep us included, as well as our planning regions like Delaware Valley Regional Planning. If you're done in the Southeast, they want to know just to be aware of what's happening. Uh, clearly, again, understand the requirements, seek out information online in other areas, reach out to us. Uh, ensure you understand the matching funding requirements. Ensure that a project is deliverable ahead of requirements. We want to come up with good applications for good projects, but the real key is to make sure we can get those delivered and delivered in a timely manner. And think about this in the long term, that you may submit an application and not get selected, but there'll be future funding rounds in, in future years of bill, IIJA. So uh, don't get discouraged. Think about how to build that and, and make, uh, you know, tee yourself up for success uh, in the future. And again, just earlier is better when it comes to communicating. And with that, I should be at my last slide. And just again, want to say thank you. And there's my email address. If there's any questions at any time, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And if I don't have the answers, I'll 
I'll try to hook you up with the right folks that do. So thank you. Ryan, thank you. It was very um, comprehensive information and also very valuable. So thank you. Next, uh, we have Skip. Again, we uh, want to try to keep it to this within 10 minutes. So we have time for Q&A. So Skip, uh, I think you're up. Perfect. Thanks so much, Paul. And uh, really, really pleased to be here uh, today to speak with you about some of the opportunities uh, specific to, to us at Andil and to, to all of you on energy and energy efficiency more specifically. So we can go to the next slide and I can kind of jump right in so, since I know we've got a limited amount of time. But first, I want to give a quick um, overview of just what is energy efficiency and, and give you all a little bit more of a feel for the jobs that that uh, we're talking about here, and and hopefully I was scrolling through the chat, a few few folks engaged in in renewables and and clean energy and energy efficiency. But when we're talking about the energy industry in the United States, if you look at that uh, that stat, those stats on the left, energy efficiency is actually the largest employer of energy jobs in the U.S., and it's not even close. You see that over two million jobs in the U.S. What do these jobs look like? You can see on this uh, chart on the right, a lot of them are working in construction, going into homes. Um, Working and uh, working in homes to upgrade, you know, putting in things like insulation, um, high-performing uh, equipment for uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, heat pumps, uh, working on windows, working on doors, making sure your home is sealed so that uh, homeowners are able to have lower utility bills. They're able to uh, be more comfortable in their homes. They're able to have improved indoor air quality, and they're also able to uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and, and contribute to the fight to climate change. So it's a huge part of what we do, especially in home performance. Um, and there's also other, other facets of the energy efficiency industry. You see manufacturing, uh, manufacturing all that equipment I just mentioned uh, is a huge part of it. Uh, and then professional services as well, business development, workforce, um, you know, working on getting this, uh, getting this out into communities and into homes, which is going to be what I'm focused on uh, talking to you about today. Um, we can go to the next slide uh, and talk a little bit about our workforce, uh, since I know that's going to be an incredibly important part of this conversation, especially when we're beginning to talk about some of the workforce development dollars included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. But you see, at least in our industry, there are challenges here uh, when we're talking about uh, workforce diversity. Um, you know, we've got some of the some of the stats here, but consistently lagging uh, for for workers, uh, people of color um, are, are underrepresented uh, in the energy efficiency workforce. I also want to flag that women are are vastly underrepresented um, in the energy efficiency workforce, um, and this is particularly important because a lot of when it comes to the residential side of things. A lot of the homes that we're talking about trying to get into and work on are the ones that are suffering the most. Um, so as far as workforces in underserved communities um, and in communities of color, this is where workforce investment needs to go. And, and I'll talk about the funding that's there in a second. But when we're talking about energy burdens, which is the percentage of household income spent on energy in your home, if you're thinking about utility bills, if you're low income, that ends up being a large part, a very large part of your, uh, your monthly paycheck is just going towards utilities in the winter, keeping your house warm, in the summer, keeping it cool. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, with, with uh, increasingly um, uh, strong, uh, strong weather changes and, and the importance of that is really, really key, especially for low-income houses. So this, so this is a really key part of uh, what we're focused on when it comes to workforce, when it comes to you know, getting into the communities that we need to serve most. Um, and so that's where we can kind of now pivot towards some of the funding opportunities out there, again, from an energy efficiency, clean energy lens here. So we go to the next slide, we can jump in a little bit. So first up, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This is the, the bill uh, that, that others were talking about, the bipartisan infrastructure law. So it had both support of Democrats and Republicans, but it was signed into law uh, a little over a year ago, November 15, 2021, um, a trillion dollars total with $550 billion in new spending. Um, and implementation on some of our key programs is already underway when it comes to energy efficiency. Um, so we can go to the next slide and, and jump in here. So some of the key programs that we're talking about when we're talking about energy efficiency, workforce development are, uh, are as follows here. So the weatherization assistance program, um, if, if, if you're not familiar, this is a really important program. It's been um, in, in, in play for, for decades, uh, since the 70s is when it was created. But this is focused exclusively on low-income homes and making sure that their homes are weatherized, that folks are seeing the upgrades they need for insulation, just fundamental things. If you're in a if you're in a low-income home, um, your, your house is going to tend to be leaky in a lot of cases. And this program is explicitly uh, focused on low-income communities covering completely the costs of their uh, the work that's needed to be done under WAP. Um, so this received a huge influx of funding. This is a pre-existing program, um, but it, it did receive billions of dollars here. 
um, it's distributed, going to be distributed across 50 states. States uh, just submitted their applications on October 1 to get at this money, uh, new money. It's part of an annual program, but a big influx of money there, given that uh, weatherization assistance program usually only gets hundreds of millions every year. So this is an order of magnitude larger influx of money. Other money included in IJ, state energy program, uh, funding for state energy offices to provide, uh, provide uh, funds for the efficient use of energy, energy efficiency, energy conservation in each state, uh, your local state energy office uh, in your state. Another one, the ECBG funds. Uh, this is another uh, program that was actually first created uh, under ARA, the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act in 2009, but it just got refunded, provides grants to states, cities, counties, tribal governments to implement energy efficiency and conservation projects uh, for transportation, for buildings and other sectors. So, so it's all fairly broad, um, but there are lots of opportunities here uh, when it comes to comes to funding. Um, some of the other key programs, uh, the revolving loan fund just for energy efficiency is focused on helping uh, states and other entities uh, set up revolving loan funds. Uh, so providing that seed money to for states to be able to start and, and other entities to start up um, energy efficiency loans um, for a, a wide variety of eligible entities. Um, so that's another exciting program that's intended to move hand in hand with some of the home rebates that I'll be talking about in a second that's included under the Inflation Reduction Act. And then these last three, I want to flag since they're explicitly workforce development dollars. Um, so dollars for training, uh, career skills training, uh, energy auditor training grant program, building training and assessment centers, which are focused on grants to colleges and universities to establish building training and assessment centers that covers training for engineers, architects, building scientists, um, and more. Um, and the key thing with all of these IIGA dollars, which are all uh, the dollars that you're seeing up here are all rolling through the Department of Energy. These all are covered under Justice 40. Uh, what, what is Justice 40, you may ask? And um, it's it's uh, a requirement uh, first established under President Biden and under an executive order issued very early on, but requiring that 40% of all of this, this funding needs to go to disadvantaged communities. Um, and so that's a really key thing when we're talking about, you know, some of these programs like WAP uh, is basically, you know, Justice 40, let's talk about Justice 100 there. That's all going to disadvantaged communities. That's all for low-income folks. Um, but it is really important to stress for some of these other things, especially when it comes to training, that the floor is 40%. Uh, that's per the Department of Energy. That's per President Biden's uh, executive order on Justice 40. So that, that is a key thing to note just with all of the programs you're seeing here, uh, at least 40%, in some cases, a lot more. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and now we're moving on to the Inflation Reduction Act. I know that uh, the focus of today's Discussion is going to be on IIJ and the, the billions that are there, um, but I do think this is an important opportunity to flag some of the other things. Uh, since this is a more recent law, uh, there's not as much, I think, out there on it, um, but it is really exciting. $370 billion in support of clean energy and energy efficiency got signed uh, August 16th. And here, whereas you know some of the dollars that, that other folks are going to be talking about are, are beginning to roll out under IRA, it's really only just starting. But um, even though it's only just starting, I do want to make sure you're all aware of some of the key programs here um, and, and that they're on your radar, especially when it comes to energy efficiency, because they're going to be really transformative, not just for, for businesses and, and MBEs and, and some of the folks in this call, but also for all of you just vis-a-vis -vis being homeowners. Um, there are rebates, really generous rebate programs for home performance in this. Um, and it, you know, just as just as how in, in the households that you're in, um, I want to make sure you know about this. So we'll go to the next slide and, and dive into some of the, the funding here. So a lot, again, on workforce and energy efficiency. Uh, the first two pieces I want to kind of lump together is, as being, you know, $8.8 .8 billion total. It's the, the HOMES program and the HERE program. Um, these are both uh, very generous rebate programs just for, uh, for single family, multifamily folks, um, homeowners, and in, in, uh, and in the case of HERE, you know, renters are potentially also eligible. But um, this is all focused on rebates to improve your home's performance. So energy efficiency, insulation, um, uh, equipment and appliances, uh, electrifying your houses, um, talking about heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, induction stoves, um, electric dryers, all of that, trying to get homes off of fossil fuels, improve their performance, um, lower your utility bills, um, improve occupant comfort, and also lower greenhouse gas emissions. That's what those programs are all for, almost $9 billion there. And then uh, when we're talking about workforce here, $200 million for state-based home energy efficiency contractor training grants. That's also going to roll out through state energy offices. Um, funding timelines here are, are very, uh, very long standing here. You'll see that through 2031. That was something that um, advocates heard loud and clear when we're talking about the American Reinvestment Recovery Act in 2009. One of the major complaints was that funding ran out too fast. 
Um, the timelines here are all in, in almost 10 year windows uh, via budget reconciliation, which is how Democrats passed this package uh, as a party line vote, unlike the uh, IIJA, which was completely uh, bipartisan. It was a group of Republican and Democratic senators working in Washington. This is exclusively Democrats voted for this bill, um, but it did pass. Uh, it passed via budget reconciliation. And that means that you're seeing timelines here, a lot of which are, are extending out into the 2030s. Um, we do expect, as a side note, expect that money to go faster than that, but it is important to note um, that it is, it is available at least through 2031. Um, other programs that I want to highlight, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Uh, this is another really, really key program. You see that number should be popping out $27 billion. Um, and there's a lot There's a lot that still remains to be decided on this program and others. Um, but this is 55% uh, of the funds in the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund are explicitly geared towards low income communities. Um, so that's a really key thing to note there. And you'll also see in the timeline there, funds are only available through 2024 in this program uh, operated by the Environment Protection Agency. Um, and so that's, you know, the, the specific date there is September 30, 2024. For those following along in the back of your note card, uh, that's a month before election day. That is not a coincidence. Those funds do need to be spent before the 2024 election, they need to be distributed um, by EPA to uh, to green banks, to local green banks, to states, to tribes, to uh, via competitive grants as well. Um, and so uh, that's gonna be a really key program to track when we're just talking about um, accessing uh, funds for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And 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 that funding is very, very wide. Uh, some, is, some of it's geared towards low-income solar, um, but a lot of the money is very, uh, you know, there aren't as much uh, details there as far as how it's spent. So it potentially is open to a lot of different activities as long as you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a key thing to note there. And then some of the tax credits as well. Um, this is, uh, I pulled out two that are really relevant to us. There obviously were key tax credits for renewable energy um, in homes, as well as just across renewable energy generation and, and more. Um, but these are two of the key ones uh, focused on um, homes. Uh, there's for existing homes, 25C, and for new homes, 45L. Um, the key thing to note here is that these are uh, just estimates as far as tax credits. There are no caps on the tax credits here for energy efficiency improvements in homes, uh, both new and existing homes. Um, so even though you're seeing that $12 billion estimate and the $2 billion estimate, could be way more. Um, it could be less, but it could be more. Uh, there's just no caps sort of uh, uh, launched there. And, and we're when we're talking about you know when folks can start to get at this funding, the tax credits are where I am referring everybody first because those come online Jan 1, 2023. So we're almost a month away here from very generous expanded tax credits for energy efficiency in homes, again, insulation, windows, heat pumps, heat pump, water heaters, all of that um, included under 25C. So we can go to the next slide. I wanna dive back briefly into those two rebate programs since they are very generous um, when we're talking about energy efficiency and electrification. Um, first up is that homes rebate program. Um, in order to even qualify for uh, for home, home energy efficiency, you need to save a certain amount of uh, energy. Um, and so that, that's how you're qualifying for funding. On the rebate programs on electrification, um, it's exclusively for low and moderate income. So again, we're talking about uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, that's only available to low and moderate income folks. If you make 150% of area median income or below, that's where if you're you're qualified there. Um, so let's keep moving because I am uh, I want to be conscious of time and make sure we get to other phenomenal speakers. I just want to hit home here that the funding allocations are out for both of these programs. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars available for Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, other states here. Um, and so really generous amounts for state energy offices to, to set up their own programs. Um, so uh, I want to go to the next slide just to be conscious of time here, but those are two key things. If we're talking about workforce, $200 million. Um, and th these are the eligible uses of funding. It's reducing the cost of training contractor employees in energy efficiency and electrification, testing and certification for outside testing to make sure that the contractors are being trained right, um, and also partnering with nonprofits uh, to develop and implement these grants. These are funds that are rolling through uh, through state energy offices, just like those rebate programs. Um, so be sure to be monitoring your state energy office to, to, to make sure you're aware of funding opportunities here. A key note on the workforce here, 200 million, between the 200 million here and the 60 million I identified in IIJA, there is gonna be a request for information out from the Department of Energy next month in December. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. They're gonna be, uh, DOE's gonna be asking questions about um, how this funding for workforce development should be used. And that's where um, folks can weigh in on, you know, the importance of targeting um, disadvantaged communities is going to be really key, uh, we think, in our in our responses. Um, so I wanted to raise that. We can go to the next slide, um, just because we kind of have time. So this is just the overall, my last slide here, is just overall massive amounts of funding between these two landmark bills, IIJ and IRA, billions of dollars to support energy efficiency and workforce. I think I covered 
pretty much all of these programs. So I won't dive back in, but um, really great opportunities. Uh, they are coming right up. IIJ is obviously a little bit ahead of IRA since it passed first, but um, these are things we are tracking actively and tracking on behalf of clients. And we're looking forward to, to speaking more during question and answer to get into a little bit of more of the details, but I just wanted to give that overview. So with that, Paul, I'll turn it back to you. It's good. Really, uh, that was really good, uh, really insightful information. So thank you. And then uh, last but not least, of course, we have Tom. Again, Tom's going to spend about 10 minutes. And then I know a couple questions are coming in. Feel free, guys, to throw your questions inside the Q&A. And I'll make sure we get to those questions as quickly as we can. So, uh, Tom? Uh, is uh, Tom, is he on mute? Sorry. Yeah, Tom, you're on mute. Okay, I'm sorry. There, yeah, and I'm going to be calling some audible since a lot of the uh, material has already been covered by the previous two speakers. But if we can go to the first slide, just uh, give everybody how, how we're looking at IIJA. Different numbers have been associated with how much funding there was. Uh, the most common one you'll hear will be about $1 billion. But as we look at that, it's really about $540, 550 billion dollars of new money. We break it up into two main categories of transportation, a lot of which you know, we've already heard discussed, and then also the kind of other infrastructure, power infrastructure, water, environmental re remediation, uh, broadband, and then just community resilience is kind of a, a bucket of funds. Um, and we have interest on both sides of this, uh, you know, kind of both parts of this tree. So if we can go to the next slide. Just a little primer on how the dollars are uh, being distributed. So of that one trillion, uh, that goes to the federal agencies, about two thirds of it will go to the states, which uh, it's all set by usually pre-existing formulas. The states get their share. Sometimes they have to provide a plan to the federal government on how they're going to spend that before they get their share of the dollars. Um, and then there's another third of the dollars that's being administered directly by the federal agencies that uh, entities, depending on who qualifies, uh, have to apply on their own through competitive grant programs. And again, we have uh, interest and we think our community has interest in both sides of this equation. So next slide. So when we break this down, we look uh, first, if you look on kind of the blue uh, column, it's the operational opportunities. This is where we have projects that we will be directly involved in, and in some cases can even be the applicant for. In the world of grid resilience, there is about $13.5 billion have been allocated under IIJA. The, there's the federal grid resilience grants 50% of this will be federal competitive, 50% will go to the states. And then Congress in its infinite wisdom produced a program called the Grid Resilience Demonstration. That's another 5 billion that's going to the states. The differences between these two grid programs in the states are really small. And I know my friends at, at certainly in Pennsylvania at the PADEP are trying to make this as streamlined as possible. Um, there's also a smart grid investment grant program. Uh, this is the same program that PICO was able to successfully secure funding for in uh, this region. Uh, uh, Baltimore Gas and Electric and PHI were also successful applicants for that program. This is anything to make the grid smarter with automation, bi-directional communications, uh, IT uh, integration. So uh, you know that's something that we are looking at uh, also, and it's really technology focused. And then looking at storage, uh, which is a huge new field. And, um, you know, it's a fairly small amount of money. So I don't know if we at Pico are going to look directly at that opportunity, just because we know the compliance costs of these grants are great. So you want to get the most bang for your buck. Right now, our big focus is on the grid resilience grant program. That allows grants of up to $100 million to do things that make it less likely that the power goes out and when it goes out, make it easier to recover. It's also um, aims to make it easier to integrate in clean energy resources and distributed resources and sets a whole bunch of evaluation criteria 
that we have been working since almost the day after this law passed to put together a what we hope will be a competitive package because we would like to bring $100 million ideally home to our region to upgrade our grid. When we spend $100 million of federal money, that's $100 million that customers don't have to pay for. And that's why it's in everybody's interest. This um, grid resilience program, as was you know, suggested earlier, every project must produce a community benefits plan. And that community benefits plan has four uh, components. The community and labor engagement component where you have to demonstrate how you are working at the local level and how you're working with the labor community to uh, create good jobs and um, you know, make sure these are jobs that are sustainable. And then the second component is investing in job quality and workforce development. Um, you know, this is a, what I think is probably gonna be one of the fastest growing fields in the next 10 years for reasons that you know, Skip alluded to earlier. Um, and we see a great deal of opportunity there. And then what are you doing to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, um, particularly to clean energy? And then the last is, you know, summarize how you're contributing to meeting that Justice 40 initiative that Skip spoke about. So everyone, every utility that is looking to apply for one of these uh, competitive grid resilience grants should be talking to their communities, particularly their disadvantaged communities, looking about how can we integrate in providing better service to you as part of our application. And that is foremost in PICO's thinking right now and something that I'm working directly on along with people like uh, my colleague, Vernice Lewis from our supplier diversity group. We also look at those opportunities where we can partner with others in our community. And you've heard some talk about these from uh, Skip and Brian, um, the EV Carters project that Brian talked about, the alternative fuel uh, charging and fueling infrastructure for underserved communities, that has not been published as an op a specific opportunity by USDOT yet. We expect it soon. This is a place we have to get down to the ground floor and say to ourselves how to get charging access for the EVs that are coming on for uh, you know first adopters in our low and moderate income communities so they don't get passed by and all this funding just go to the more affluent areas. This is gonna take real community-based organization and planning. And I will say we at PICO not only wanna be part of it, we wanna be one of the anchor tenants in helping plan that. Clean school buses, there's $5 billion. This might be the most generous program in IIJA. It will pay all of the incremental cost of buying an electric school bus versus a conventional uh, diesel school bus, and then pay all of the cost that a uh, customer would have to pay for in infrastructure upgrades. Um, we were very disappointed. No one in our service territory won in the first round of grant funding. We did have at least one applicant and it was a open lottery. So unfortunately it was a matter of whether you got your name picked out of a hat, but I will say the more, the more people in your community apply, the greater chance you're gonna get selected. And this is an opportunity, you all are all community leaders too. Talk at your school boards, talk to your local uh, elected officials, talk to your local um, you know, uh, principals. Make sure they know this money is out there because I personally would much rather have the school bus coming through my neighborhood, uh, coming through not putting out any emissions out the tailpipe than putting out diesel emissions in my neighborhood and into my, my own children's lungs. So please take a look at this and encourage your communities to participate and look at how you might uh, participate as well as a contractor. Um, we talked a lot about um, you know, weatherization and energy efficiency already. There's funding for electrifying trans transit ports, airports, and then a whole new initiative called the Hydrogen Hub, where there's $8 billion to, there's some ap energy applications that electricity isn't going to be a good substitute for um, liquid fossil fuels, and but hydrogen can be, and this is a really early stage industry. Pico is a supporter of an application for what's called the Mach 2 Delaware Valley-based hydrogen hub application. 
Um, we're working with our Chamber of Commerce, who's going to be holding information sessions on this in December. We're looking for all parties who'd be interested in participating. And this is going to have the same um, Justice 40 community benefits requirements as the other programs. So think about how you can get involved in testing kind of liquid fuel applications. It could be something as simple as if you do landscaping, um, switching over some of your equipment to run on, uh, you know, on, on hydrogen and being an off taker. Same thing on the electric side with some of these state grants. If you do snow removal, you do landscaping, you do um, you know, something involved in street cleaning. If you're willing to go to a clean energy source, there's opportunity here for you to get state or federal funding. So next slide. And then there's the IRA. This is, as it was talked about earlier, in terms of the program side of this, um, it's running behind the IIJA because IIJ was passed first. But as, uh, as Skip was talking about, altogether, we look at about $37.5 billion in funding at the community and state level for of energy efficiency and clean energy on top of the tax credits that are being provided on the clean energy side and on the energy efficiency side. So there's going to be over the next decade, almost unlimited amount of economic opportunity for people working in this space. We're gonna be following the development of the federal program requirements and then the state plans on these community-based programs for clean energy and emission reduction under the IRA. And part of it is coordinating what we can do, what the state's doing under IIJA and what's going on, on, on under IRA. So with that, let me leave some uh, time for questions. Awesome. Tom, I uh, really appreciate it. This is Tom, Skip, Brian, thank you guys. Uh, I know there's a couple of questions already started to come in, but the I know the one question that's probably key uh, for many is, and I'm going to start with maybe Dina for this. Um, what kind of products or service, Dina, DJ, is where I'll go. Uh, what kind of products or services, Dana? We talked about a lot of money that's going to be coming into the market. So um, what kind of products or services are you guys looking for at Franklin to help you support this type of initiative? Um, I mean, if we're looking, and I think we've all kind of touched, everyone's kind of touched this, the workforce is key. Um, I don't know that we really kind of understand the components of workforce. Workforce isn't just the people that are going out and doing the work. It's the people that are helping to train, the people that are helping to recruit. All of that is necessary. And this is nuanced work. It's not something, it's not your day-to-day -day kind of work. So there's a level of training that's required with this. Um, so I would definitely say that first. Um, and then when you're thinking from the perspective of even the Justice 40, the categories of investment for that funding is climate change. So anything around climate change um, is, is the type of, of services that are going to be needed. Clean energy and energy efficiency, you know, we've talked about that at um, at, a, at a higher level, you know, so anything that is in from that perspective, you know, Franklin is an energy efficiency organization. So we're looking at um, not only those who can go in and um, do the type of work that's needed to be done from the whole home perspective, um, but we're also in the EV space. So those who can help with um, the make ready portion of EV. We're looking for people that can do that type of work. Um, you know, we've talked about clean transit, affordable and sustainable housing. All of these things are, are things that are going to be, the types of services I think are going to be needed in order for, um, Number one, the uh, IJA to be successful, the IRA to be successful, but number two, for organizations like this and the people that are members of this organization to be able to tap into that funding. Awesome. Thanks, Dean. I appreciate it. Um, how about you? I was going to say, uh, Brian from your lens, uh, Brian here, um, what kind of products or services will the state of PA look for, the Commonwealth of PA look for to support their, those uh, initiatives and those funding dollars? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as I said, it's it's all hands on deck. So any, any transportation related, and that can be in, in the delivery of projects. Uh, design, I saw uh, in the chat with some of the groups involved in uh, uh, environmental related issues, uh, doing in, environmental studies in the preliminary engineering phase. Uh, there's a whole host of opportunities and it could, we could spend an hour and a half just talking about scratching the surface on the PennDOT opportunities. 
I will say it just to maybe to echo, you know, with, with the electric vehicle uh, charging, uh, as well as the resiliency of our infrastructure. Those are two key areas that we're absolutely going to be focusing on. And, and with electric vehicles in particular, the electric vehicle charging, uh, that's so new to us. And, and we're just, uh, you know, we're just a part of, you know, one, one element of the stakeholder group that's involved with that. And it's, it's been fun. And I hopefully, uh, you know, I encourage folks, if you haven't already, and you're interested in uh, seeing what's available in that sector, please uh, view, go on PennDOT's website and, and Google electric vehicle charging or NEVI, N-E-V-I. Uh, and there's plenty of opportunities. We've done a lot of outreach already. and We'll be continuing to do stakeholder outreach, but it's really exciting on events like this uh, to see the networking that's actually taking place in the chat box while we're talking about uh, where PennDOT's going individuals in the chat box are talking about, hey, I'm going to be at this location next week. I'll be at this meeting in two weeks. Look me up. Talk to me there. I provide this service or that service. Uh, it's really, it's matchmaking. It's it's connecting the right people at the right time. You talked about that earlier with the timing, uh, and the timing is right now, in particular, with the uh, electric vehicle infrastructure charging. So, yeah, certainly welcome anyone. If you want to get involved, certainly check out PennDOT's website if you haven't already. Look for doing business with us. Go under that tab, and there's a a host of uh, various uh, opportunities for small businesses and uh, others uh, to get engaged. So please do. Thank you. No, Brian, I appreciate it. And um, I mean, I'll, I'll do a small insight from our perspective, getting into this industry was a very difficult thing for us four years ago, but the one thing that did help you just alluded to Brian, those partnerships, right? So it's got, it's not going to be one or two firms to do it by themselves. You guys have to find ways to align and partner, not only amongst other small businesses, amongst other MBEs, but also partnership with some of these large firms. Tom, you have your hands up. Yeah, and I was just going to add on that, Paul. At the local level, especially in that competitive EV charging program, having folks who can say, this is where we have an available plot of land. This is close to where we have like um, you know other commercial opportunities, shopping opportunities. This is where people who are local Uber drivers who need a place to charge and could save a whole lot of money by driving an EV rather than a gas vehicle, this would be a convenient location for them. And, um, you know, we'd like to maybe draw some people in to, uh, to be shoppers in some of our stores. This would be a great location. If you can find those locations and get them to people like your regional planning commission, you get them to your utilities and I'll forward you there, get them to your city governments. We want to bring those dollars back to our communities and putting the pieces to the puzzle together is challenging. I think the folks who are closest to the ground will have the best ability to do that. I was going to go over to Dina. Um, from there. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say, I come into the same DJ, Dina, so that's, that's my fault. Um, so Dina from American Water. Water, um, you guys have done a great job of helping some of the small MBs locally to grow and scale. What do some of the MBs need to do to prepare for such large projects from your perspective, Dina? That's a great question. And, uh, you know, it's really an ongoing process. I, I, you're all familiar with the saying, if you, if you stay ready, you never have to get ready. So we're talk, you know, we looked at some timelines earlier through some of the presentations. This act is going to impact us for decades. So it's a good opportunity to educate, um, educate yourself. I would say from, particularly from, for the water utility industry to really educate, um, yourselves on what it is that we do specifically. Take a look at, um, I'll say Pennsylvania and New Jersey American Water specific websites to understand the footprints. Um, our territories understand prior work so you can get a, a feel for what the work is. And uh, one of the, the main things I would say is to start to develop relationships with supplier diversity professionals. Uh, we are really, um, I hate to call us the gatekeepers, but in a lot of ways, we are the gatekeepers specifically for American Water because our, our bids are not public. So if you wanna know what we're doing, you really have to build, start to build a relationship um, with the supplier diversity team, uh, myself, uh, Larry Wooten is also um, a panelist. And then look at, um, insurance requirements, you know, look at, start to really look at how much money 
uh, is going to be required to even do business. But beyond American Water, look at all the utilities um, in your areas and get an idea for what they're going to be doing, what the projects are. Um, you know, American Water does have a large footprint in, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, but we are not the only water utility uh, in those states. So I would say really educate yourself on which water utility is, is covered, which territory, um, what all the requirements are. Um, I'm also gonna add, take a look at um, and learn a little bit more about the ESG initiatives, the uh, environment, social governance initiatives that each company has and what you may to, need to do from a capability standpoint to um, get your business ready from that perspective so that you can do business with all the companies that have ESG initiatives. Hey, hey Paul, can I interject for a minute also? Please. Yeah, and, and Dina's right. Uh, it's more about being, understanding who we are as a company, et cetera. <clears throat> to Dina's point about our footprint in both of the states, um, we provided the uh, council a brief presentation. We're not gonna share it here, but it gives you the footprint for both New Jersey and Pennsylvania on where we are. So I would just ask uh, Paul and uh, the council to share that with all attendees. And it gives you a very good uh, overview of uh, our footprint. As Dina mentioned, uh, that presentation also includes uh, uh, past projects, which will help you understand uh, what the type of work we do. Um, as we talk about this act and we talk about the infrastructure bill, I, I went to my engineering leads in both New Jersey and PA and asked them the question, are we looking to take advantage of this funding, et cetera? And the message back to me is that we really look to fund our projects privately. We do look at federal money at times, but we either use private uh, equity in, uh, uh, investing or things of that nature. It was also mentioned that the iBank of New Jersey is, an, is a resource that we use if we are gonna use federal funding. And um, the link to the iBank of New Jersey, I. We also provided that to uh, Paul and the team. So uh, if they would share that with this group. And if you are interested in projects which are being funded through this act, the iBank of New Jersey will be that resource to do that. But Dina's spot on as far as the work with us. It's really about understanding who we are as a company and what our footprint is and things of that nature. And uh, to build relationships with myself and Dina. Uh, and, and I also, uh, I'll close with this. I also tell suppliers all the time, if you have a connection within engineering or operations, don't be afraid to use that connection. Um, they, it, it, you know, a lot of times, yes, we are uh, the, the, the people on the front line who meet with suppliers, but use all the resources that are available to you uh, to know more about who we are, what we do, et cetera. Uh, um, and, and we can definitely help you navigate that, the, the uh, infrastructure of American water. So thanks, Paul. Oh, Lawrence, I appreciate it. I was going to go this one to skip. Uh, you mentioned Justice 40 and the impact on the uh, the local community, disadvantaged communities. Why is, how does that play a part in the IIJ and the products and services you offer, Skip? So if we know that Justice 40 exists, why is that critical for a small business to understand? Great, great question. And, and yeah, I think I think the key to note is just that there are going to be these opportunities that are just be coming. Um, they're they're required by executive order. And, and then now DOE has adopted them when we're talking about the Department of Energy that's going to be administering these programs that um, these are real opportunities that are rolling down. As I mentioned, the weatherization assistance program, that's one where it's, as I said, kind of more of a J100 as opposed to a J40. But um, a lot of the other pieces, especially when it comes to workforce development, um, as I noted, there's that $40 billion for energy auditor training. Um, so if you're looking at 40%, you're looking at a su substantial portion of that money um, going towards uh, training of energy auditors who are folks who are going into homes um, uh, and you know maybe in a second career going into homes, uh, learning a new, uh, new skill set to go into homes and figure out you know, ways that you can improve energy efficiency in the homes uh, and propose that to homeowners, which is the key first step when you're talking about pursuing energy efficiency upgrades, which were badly needed in low-income communities. Uh, and then some of those other uh, pieces, training set up uh, at public colleges, universities, other entities, um, that are really uh, going to be key to, to building up the workforce and also diversifying the workforce, as I had noted at the top that, uh, you know, when we're talking and, and DJ can probably speak more to it as well, when we're talking about these energy efficiency jobs, we're seeing, you know, a, a disproportionate uh, underrepresentation um, from a lot of the communities that uh, workers are you know, needing to serve if we're going to get to 
our climate net zero goals and if we're going to get to uh, improving homeowner comfort from across uh, across the nation. So um, a lot of dollars in IJ, I, I call out those workforce development dollars is probably being particularly impactful, but there are other programs that are, you know, things like state energy office dollars. Um, you know, making sure that that's just as 40 layered onto it, that's every state is getting that money. Um, and they're going to have uh, a significant amount of uh, discretion in order to figure out uh, where those funds are going to get deployed. Um, but keeping that uh, lens uh, of equity uh, front and center is going to be really important. Awesome. I'll even maybe throw that same question to you, DJ, from your lens. Uh, how critical is Justice 40 and some of the other equity um, goals within I IIJA impact for the small business? It's it's huge. I, there's a strong intentionality, and Skip kind of alluded to that with regards to the partnerships um, with diverse organizations. Um, so it, it's it's a necessity. Uh, they're they're being very intentional. This bill carving out forty percent of all of this funding specifically to, you know, a sector that has been completely underserved says a lot. Um, but it requires the workforce to do so. And that's where, you know, for, since, you know, this past IIJ passed in 2021, IRA passed um, earlier this year, the, the words that I'm hearing in all of the conversations that I've been uh, privy to is, is we don't know where to find the workforce. Um, and so that means that, it, and when I say the workforce, I'm referring to the diverse workforce. If you remember Skip's slide, that diverse for the workforce is, is not diverse at all. Um, and so, it requires an intentionality of getting into workforce, but not only bringing in that workforce, making sure that they feel comfortable enough to stay in the space. Um, and I know that's something that we are paying attention to at Franklin uh, when it comes to our hiring practices, not only bringing in diversity, but making sure that they have, they feel that the culture that they are moving into is a place where they want to stay. And for a long time, diverse people have not been a part of it. If you look from even the larger perspective of the utility space, you know, that is changing. It was it was always very much a male, white male dominated field that is starting to shift. So if you take the energy efficiency space, which is a subset of the energy space, it is even less diverse. And so there is, has to be an intentionality. That's where organizations like this one come into play, where you can find places where you can fit into the work and the, the, the needs of um, energy efficiency. Awesome. DJ, I really appreciate it. Uh, one of the other questions I was throwing out there, and feel free to answer this, anyone. Is there an agency available to support local, um, says local government with grant application? I believe this lady's asking, grant writings are very expensive and tough to find. Um, where do you find those resources? And also can small for-profit companies apply for grants? Anyone can take this. I'll start with the second question, which is the easier one. I think yeah. for many of these programs, yes, small for-profit companies are eligible. I think you're gonna see that, especially with the state administered uh, programs. And again, I, I know the most about the energy uh, opportunities, but um, when you see those state programs, dollars are coming out in smaller chunks, they're likely to be um, probably smaller than utilities wanna be direct applicants for, but we're looking for opportunities to partner with our uh, customers and communities to try to bring those dollars home and put them to good use on clean energy and resiliency projects. Um, I think I, I was talking to someone from the state and Pennsylvania State Energy Programs Office this morning. They are still thinking that through. They need to figure out what is the channel to get from Harrisburg down to the local level and to make those connections. Um, and that's an area where if, you know, for example, you're working with the, if you're a member of your local electricians association, start talking with them about how they can be a conduit between your business and the state dollars. Well, as far as in terms of grant writing and things of that nature, my only answer to that right now, because I, I do have a government background working for a prime contractor, I, I would look to the SBA. Most people look to the SBA for loans and things of that nature but the SBA has a number of other resources uh, that can help small and diverse businesses uh, gain access to grant writers and things of that, that sort. Um, they have a program which is called SCORE, which is it's basically retired executives from uh, different organizations from like, like ours or, or other major corporations that basically mentor uh, diverse, small, small and diverse businesses. So my first point would be, if you're looking for resources like that, Talk to your local SBA rep. Uh, it is 
uh, um, an, an organization that can help you in a number of different ways and alleviate some of those costs that would go with finding a consultant to write grants and things of that nature. No, that's uh, that's great feedback, Lawrence. Thank you. You said that that score and a lot of this information, just so we are, we all know, we will get a comprehensive email sent out to all the attendees. Um, so we'll make sure to include that information in there as well. Uh, one of the other questions we had was, what are some of the emerging technologies that we need to be aware of as a small business? So again, we we know grid optimization. Um, that may not be a new technology, but there may be new technology needed to help to achieve that goal. But there are other new technologies, Tom. Um, I'll say Tom, Dean, and Skip, but from your lens that are inside IAJ that small business need to be aware of? Um, you know, one, if you operate vehicles, look at can I save money by switching to electric, especially if I can get assistance with putting in the charging infrastructure and get some of that cost offset. The, the biggest thing in our industry for decades to come is going to be batteries. Everything is about batteries. And, um, you know, I don't know, I'm not on the technical side. I don't know what you have to learn as a contractor in terms of doing installation of batteries and integrating them into home and business electric systems. But if I were in that field, I'd sure be wanting to learn. And then the last thing, uh, you know, workforce. And I think we've said it over and over again. I just a workforce that can work in and is familiar with these emerging technologies. Skip or Dean, anything you guys want to add to that? Yeah, a couple things that, um, that I'll add, a little different perspective, um, and this is very specific to uh, the construction industry um, or those you know that would provide construction services. A tool called ISN, which is collects and reviews health and safety of a business. And a company like American Water, we use that to score contractors on their safety records to make sure they meet the standards that we can do work with. Uh, and another thing would be something like uh, Escovadis, which is an ESG uh, reporting tool. So I mentioned ESG, I would really uh, recommend taking the time to learn more about ESG um, and, and the tools that are out there to help propel your business forward. Awesome. Did anything on DJ or Skip from your lens? I would add the solar compete component um, is, is huge. Um, and I've heard of, and this is just a way to even think about it from this perspective, people pivoting who do uh, roofing have sent some of their people to learn how to install solar. So if I'm up there and I'm repairing your roof, I can also install solar for you at, on as well. And there's so many grants just for solar installation and all of that. I think that's another component if you haven't thought about it is, is a, a way to look at it as well. No, that's a, uh, that's a really good point, Dina. I want to maybe, uh, DJ, I'll say, and Dina, both good points. Uh, but I think once you understand the supply chain of the work that's being done, you have to figure out where, do, where does my service, my product align to that supply chain? So I think that that's a really good example. If we're already on the roof, why not go learn something else to allow us to provide more value to our customers? So And that can be applied to marketing, to sales, to IT. There's so many other services that we all provide that we just need to fully understand the full supply chain of how these industries work. So Skip, go right ahead, please. Totally, and just, just to echo Dina's point, as, as uh, she mentioned, you know, there are tax credits there for, for solar with the 25D uh, clean energy property tax credit. And then when we're talking about technologies, again, this is uh, in the IRA, not the IJA, but when we're talking about technologies that go together, I think the high efficiency electric home rebate program is a great one to look at just because there's, the, there's just listed uh, off the top a, a lot of co-benefit um, technologies you can install at once. So if you're going to be, you know, installing a new technology like a heat pump for home, home heating, uh, you want to go ahead and, and install a new breaker box there too to, to handle the new uh, higher load of, of electricity there. You also want to install new insulation to make sure that um, the home is not leaking out the, the warmer, cool air that you're now um, getting with the high efficiency heat pump. Um, and then, you know, being able to, you know, have a breaker box potentially support rooftop solar, other pieces of that um, element. I think they all can work together. So to the extent we can, you know, train up the workforce and, and make them aware of all the opportunities, uh, that's going to be incredibly important the way they all nestle together. A lot of that has yet to be decided. We're waiting on guidance from the U.S. Treasury on the tax credits. We're waiting for guidance from DOE on the rebates, um, but making sure that contractors are trained up to, so they're able to convey, especially to low-income homeowners who are uh, who are not necessarily aware of a lot of the money that's out there that's specifically geared towards them. Um, that's going to be really key uh, to make sure 
folks are aware of the funding uh, and aware of the benefits, and then also able to kind of leverage in the, in the fewest number of touch points possible so they don't have to keep going back and forth to the store, keep calling in one contractor to just do one job and, and look at projects in a whole house way to improve uh, home performance. Got it. That's a great uh, point, Skip. I was going to say this one back for you, Tom. Uh, it sounds like you've, you've been part of a couple other uh, legislation that's been passed uh, around policy within the energy sector. What will be your recommendation to small business? Is how can they continue to, um, of course, understand the legislation, but also how can they provide services um, that are needed uh, for not only the IIJ, but also IRA? Like what steps can they take ahead of time to put themselves in a position to be successful? I, I think, you know, and, and I'm talking about this from the perspective of somebody who is working on trying to put together pieces into a larger puzzle. Yeah. If you can figure out what is my niche, what can I do? And then if it's in the water space, approach American water and say this is a, um, you know, a community focused program that that I could do and bring it to us largely, you know, fully baked, where we don't have to try to cr- you know, create this from scratch, it's really hard for us to figure out what's the new thing that I can do that's community focused, uh, maybe involves a new technology, and then pull that all together in the tight time frame that it takes to respond to one of these applications. Whereas if you can come up to us with a fully developed concept or an almost fully developed concept, we can say, yeah, we can just plug and play that. That is, that is the best way, I think, or, and, and what's likely to be most effective for both of us. Cool. Does anyone else want to add to that? It's great feedback, Tom. I think it just requires uh, just paying attention. Um, in Illinois, there was something called the Clean Energy Jobs Act that was passed about a year or so ago. And um, it's been huge. And in coming on the cusp of the IIJM bill, it's going to push Illinois to the forefront of clean energy. Um, but there was a lot of conversation happening on the local level one before the bill passed and then once the bill passed because they're looking to you know these local organizations who are boots on the ground to figure out the best way to implement these programs this funding and things of that sort get to uh, if you're not tapped in, get tapped into your local organizations that are tied into the utilities, their rate cases, the things that they're following, things of that sort, um, any, you know, major projects that the utilities are wanting to do, pay attention to those. And those will be ways where you can figure out, you know, is this something I can do to maybe apply for a particular contract or whatever the case may be, um, or look for partnerships. Those partnerships are huge. If it's something that, you know, you know, for, for example, for the work that we do, um, we partner with a number of local organizations that help to go out and do our audits, that help to go out and do, you know, the installation of um, thermostats and things of that sort, that whole home look, you know, we partner with those local organizations that have boots on the ground that can get us into those community conversations. That's a good way to start. Awesome. And this was for you, Brian, or some of uh, Zay Lawrence. I just want to uh, add to what, what DJ is saying, because it's true. Um, Yes, you should come to American Water and find out what we're doing, how we're doing it, et cetera. But DJ is correct. For the most part, we are a regulated utility. We are regulated in each state that we operate in. Some states are more stringent than others, uh, and Illinois being one of those stringent states, okay? But the point being is that if you want to know what American Water truly is doing, take a look at what the state is doing from a water efficiency perspective or whatever, or or what they are asking the utilities to do. To Dina's point earlier that we are not the only water utility in the states we operate in. So there, so the state overall regulates us. Find out what the state is requiring of companies such as American Water, and then you'll know exactly what we're doing, to be quite honest. Uh, yes, come to us, but definitely take a look at what the state is requiring from a project perspective and things of that nature. We have this huge lead line replacement project going on, which is going to be five to 10 years where we are replacing lead service lines across the country. So when you talk about an opportunity, that is a huge opportunity for us at American Water, where we're looking for suppliers. So again, to DJ's point, take a look at what the states are looking for, what they are regulating, what they are asking utilities to do, and you'll know exactly what is important to American Water, and that's how you align yourself with doing business with us. So hopefully that helps. Thanks, Lance. Brian, go right ahead. 
Yes, sir, Paul. Hey, I, I know we're uh, we're getting close to the end, and I have an important uh, opportunity to share with folks while, while I have some time. And it's all about the partnerships, uh, because again, I, I know I started out by saying it, but it, it is a critical that we get uh, those small businesses, uh, disadvantaged businesses, and such. Uh, tuned into what PennDOT's doing and, and where we're at and where we're heading. And I, I hope folks, uh, ha some folks at least, had an opportunity to attend the Pathways to PennDOT conference. It was a, a conference specifically for our DBEs that was held a little over a month ago, October 18th. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that's not a, a, just a one-time thing. I'm, I'm hoping there'll be future opportunities like that. But one of the things, and this is really my qu quick message here, uh, one of the things that was talked about at that session was our new uh, mentor protege uh, program where we we try to connect experts. It's almost like thriving communities only at this local state level, uh, where we try to connect uh, those that have experience in consulting, prime engineering firms and such, and, and we connect those with folks that are trying to get a kind of a leg up and a boost. So please, if you're interested in the transportation sector, uh, stay tuned into that mentor protege opportunity uh, in the future. And if you have questions about that, reach out to me and I can connect you to folks that have a whole lot more insight into that than I do. But I just want to make sure I shared that before we had to close today. Thank you. No worries. We have, we have three minutes. I'm going to take this opportunity to maybe um, ask everyone what will be your maybe your biggest advice, right? Think whether it's uh, on this call, many small business, everything from IT, consulting, workforce development, marketing, from what you know about the IIJA and even the IRA, what will be your biggest advice to the participants of today's webinar? I'll start with you, Skip. Great question. I'd say uh, stay engaged uh, and stay aware. I know it, you know a lot of a lot of folks on the call. You're running your own business. You're you're busy, you know, managing employees, managing the rest of it. But I would say keep your eye out, keep your ears open. Um, conversations like this are important to getting the word out. But there is billions of dollars uh, coming down the line. A lot of it is already beginning to roll out. When we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act and the focus on climate and work in homes, which is what we're focused on, a lot of that money is where we're beginning to look at next year. Um, so please stay aware. Uh, please stay, stay connected to this organization and and others uh, to to make sure you're you're not caught off guard and, and begin to prepare now to leverage that funding uh, for your businesses and make it work for you. Awesome, thanks, uh, DJ. How about you? Um, I would definitely say network. Uh, so organizations like this will help with that. Um, oftentimes in the moment when organizations are trying to get work done, they're thinking at the top of their head of who they can partner with. If they don't know you, they won't think about you. So make sure that you're making those connections where you can with organizations, making sure that they know what it is that you do or what your capabilities are. Um, and make sure that you stay connected, whether it's a quarterly email, a quarterly newsletter of the work that you're doing in your organization, whatever the case may be, because if your organization is not at the forefront of these companies that are you know, really in charge of doing that business, they may not be thinking about you as they start to process these programs. Thanks, DJ. How about you, Tom? Um, you know, speaking for PICA, we have a number of job training programs that we support in the, you know, both in the schools and for uh, young adults. Um, learn more about those, connect in with them. If you have any chance to take someone on as an apprentice, as an intern, and engage with our programs that are doing and supporting that job training, that is a great way to get visibility with us. Tom, thank you. Uh, how about you, Lawrence? I always say, know us better than we know ourselves. That might not be fair to different suppliers, but um, you have to know us better than we know ourselves. Know our pain points, know what we're looking for. And you only get that by, as, as uh, DJ mentioned, is that networking and finding out what are some of our pain points? What are we doing? Staying connected to the regulatory authorities to know what is coming down the pike. So basically, know us better than we know ourselves. Uh, and and come with uh, solutions, which have been mentioned uh, before. Um, I often say we're, we're a mature supply base for the most part. We're a mature company. Uh, so you have to come with solutions and doing it better than your competitor uh, to, in order to get that opportunity. So that would be my advice. Awesome. How about you, Dina? A lot of great advice has already been given, um, but I'll say uh, I think it's a good time to really evaluate your business model and determine if you're pre already prepared to take advantage of the opportunities out there 
or is it time to pivot to get ready? You may need to make some changes to your business model, your service offerings, et cetera, uh, to take advantage, but just don't miss the opportunity um, to take advantage of the funding and the projects that will be available. Awesome, now, Brian here. Yeah, thank you again. And I, I'm just going to say, tune in to the PennDOT's website and doing business with us. And I did, and I'm not sure if everyone's seeing the chat. So Paul, if maybe you could share if, if everyone's not seeing it, but I did post that uh, mentor protege because that opportunity has been developed and it's continuing to emerge. And I'm proud to say that my office is funding it through the program center. Uh, but uh, yeah, for folks that are interested in the transportation sector, and you want to get teamed up with folks that have had that have are steeped in experience, and you want to get you know have some of that rub off on you, uh, and and get yourself moving ahead, please do and, and look into that program. And if you have questions, reach out to me. Thank you again. Awesome. I want to end by saying uh, thank you again to all the panelists. This information was extremely beneficial. I'll say for those individuals that were participants, it's a lot that we threw at you guys today. Um, but with that said. Um, take the time over the next few weeks, hopefully there's some downtime and just do the research, right? Um, and also reach out to others that are inside this industry, reach out to the council, myself, Brian and the team, we're more than happy to help you guys. But thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, if I don't see most of you guys, happy, uh, happy holidays. I'm gonna throw this back to Brian. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm a fly on the wall here and I have to be uh, very thankful to everyone who participated as a panelist and all the attendees. This is amazing information and indicative of the type of things we're trying to do at the council to make sure we have impactful things for everyone here. And as always, things ending in an ellipse as opposed to a period. So stay tuned for additional um, content, um, additional follow-up on this. I'm gonna speak very slowly and give you guys a tip. Go through the chat, do a little cutting and pasting, drop it onto a document. There's a lot of information and contact stuff being dropped in that space. So. I want to make sure that um, I thank Paul as our as our host here um, and my team for doing a great job of putting this together. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what type of opportunities are created for our MBE space. And as always, let's push ourselves to be market leaders and not secondary in the market. I want to make sure that we're in the space where our MBE community are first in line for opportunities such as this, recalibrating their businesses, expanding connecting with their peers and creating the type of beneficial relationships that we always try to do. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I did note some of the uh, holiday food suggestions early on and I will partake. Save me a plate, everyone. Awesome. Have a great holiday. Thank you guys. How are we going guys? Bye. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was a great session. No, thank you guys for making it. Bye. <clears throat>